are about to set out on a truly Alaskan road trip. And somewhere around here is the perfect piece of history to get us inspired. Wow, look at this old thing. We're gonna be traveling the same road that this car was originally brought to Alaska to take on. The Valdez Trail, now known as the Richardson Highway, was an important route in the early 1900s, funneling adventurous prospectors in and out of interior Alaska, first by foot, then horse, then automobile. So to give you some idea of how grueling the trail used to be, this car survived only two trips before it was permanently out of commission. Today, the Richardson Highway is still a main vein for interior Alaska. And it's the focus of our spring adventure. Now you can rent RVs in April if you act quickly enough, but for this trip, we'll be relying on a relic of our own, a 1982 Winnebago Brave. Let's hope this thing still has some life in her. I got myself some driving glasses. 82 Winnebago driving glasses. Everybody loves Fairbanks this time of year. It's known for its beauty. Break up beauty. Our trip starts in Fairbanks, end of the Richardson Highway. We'll head south to Valdez, stopping in Delta Junction to try some local cuisine, the Black Rabbit's Roadhouse to get a history lesson, and continue on to Summit Lake, where we'll experience the annual extreme sports adventure called Arctic Man, nestled deep in the Alaska Range. From there, we'll continue south to Glen Allen, and on through the Chugach Mountains to Valdez, over 360 miles in all. We believed in hormone steroid free meat and meat with some flavor. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what we're here for and that's what we're doing. We're very fortunate in Delta. We've got a yak farmer, we've got an elk farmer, and uh, there's a man over in Ninana that raises reindeer. So there's a nice variety. That's a lot of meat. <laughs> Look at this stuff. There's yak. Snack sticks, summer sausage, and they have elk, they have the same thing. Snack sticks, summer sausage, Polish sausage, snack nuggets, elk kebab, elk gumbo. <laughs> I'm trying yak for the first time. Perfect for a road trip. I've been well fed while I'm in Delta.
early Valdez Trail was difficult to say the least. Miners began walking it in the early 1900s and the first car made the trip in 1914. The ruggedness of the trail was cushioned only by the steady string of roadhouses that cropped up about every 20 miles or so. That was the average daily travel distance back then. Of the original roadhouses, only a handful still exist. They were built for utility and shelter, and most have burned down or have been left to deteriorate. The Black Rapids Roadhouse was on its way to the same fate, but over the past few years, a restoration effort has been underway. So you're either the smartest man alive or the craziest. Oh, it's the craziest, yeah, and it's, it's still a toss-up. You know, the old guys, <laughs> They just sort of built it with what they had handy. To recreate it takes a lot of money. And so we're going to be you know, chipping away at it and adding to it. So are you a history buff, Mike? Nope. Or? Nope. No, it, it is, this place survived thanks to my wife. I was ready with a bulldozer to take the whole thing down, and right. she convinced me that, that it, it was worth saving. I, I didn't believe it. There's snow drifts in here. And now you are exploring at your own risk. I just noticed our, the beam that I put up many years ago is a little on the low side. Oh, Lord. But we'll have to trust that that thing's going to hold itself. Do you know much about the history? Like, what was it like when this was functioning as a roadhouse? We're slowly putting together the stories for it. Um, people stop by all the time, want to see where Frank, Frank Glazer. As a matter of fact, um, my little boy, he, that's what he calls this place. It's Frank's place. Right. He does? Uh-huh, because we told him all about Frank Glazer, and he came through in 1917, I think, and he was first a, a hunter for the road crew. He'd hunt sheep, and, there were, and you can still, there's lots of bell sheep up in these hills, and he'd, you know, pack them down and feed the crew here, and then he took over running this place for about 10 years. He would regularly hike to Fairbanks from here, yeah. and I'd drive it, and it takes me three hours, and wonder, you know, this is a long drive and stuff, and then i stop and. You know, think about this guy who used to follow caribou herds. You know, they'd pack the snow for him so he could follow their, their tracks and not, and not plunge through the snow and stuff. So I, that stops me from complaining, complaining about the drive for about 10 minutes. Yeah. But we figure there's not going to be too many people who are going to be satisfied to sleep in this, right, and, and, and eat sheep who we drag down from the hillside. <laughs> so yeah, we figured we'd better, you know, we'd better make something a little more luxurious. And the minute I got up here, and started considering, I knew there was no other place but to put the lodge, because you get up here, it's a different world, look. It's a great project, because it's, we don't have ready sources of energy here, and this is a severe environment, so we had to build it from the ground up as energy efficient as we could. These walls are like 13 inches thick, I think. Wow. They're eight inches of concrete, which is like a heat sink for um, the heat from the building, and there's two and a half inches of foam on both sides. It was it was sort of out of necessity that we we make this thing a model, like a roadside model for how to conserve what resources you have. But it kind of fits with what we want to do down here. I don't want to disturb this place. I mean, I tried to design a building that fits in with the whole hillside, and I think that's how we have to start approaching energy. You know, here in Alaska and elsewhere too. You know, we have to start trying to fit in instead of dominate the earth. And so that's kind of how we'd like to, this place to look and operate. Beautiful. So I gotta do something about this ice. I don't think this is in the plans. <laughs> oh, April's are my favorite months down here. March and April are amazing down here. I mean, and people don't know that. People just are waiting for breakup in Fairbanks and they don't realize, so unless they're like cross country skiers or something. Or snow machiners too. They do know that. Yeah, some of the snow machiners know that. Arctic Man has been called Alaska's Mardi Gras. In its 20 years, it's become an extreme sports spectacle, attracting thousands to the Hoodoo Mountains of the Alaska Range. Okay, Joey, come on up and it's part competition, part campground, and big part party. If Alaska had a festival to honor the snow machine, this would be it. Oh, no. You're firing, like your brain's firing so quick when you're going at those speeds. First see it, decide what you're going to do, and then react, and you're going 80 miles an hour. 
Sunny Prather helped pioneer the women's snowboarding division. We wrecked at 85 over the top. How are you? Did you get hurt? I did. I'm are not going to okay? tell you where. <laughs> well, you don't need stitches, do you? No. Okay. I don't need stitches, and um, now I know I can wreck at 85. <laughs> Good to have that understanding before the race day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the course starts out in the top peak, known as the tip. It's a straight shot. Uh, we try and grab as much speed as you can. Then you drop into what's known as the upper canyon. If there's lots of snow, it's nice and smooth. If there's not very much snow, you gotta avoid a couple boulders and a couple pretty big ditches. Through here, which is called the hookup, where the skier and the snow machine in tandem have to maneuver through the canyon to the uphill section where they have a radar called over the top. Touched 80 right before he went that way. Okay. The course record's about four, just over four minutes, four minutes, seven seconds. That's a long ways. That is a long way. That line was pretty good. You plan for like eight months to show up to Arctic Man, have a blast with all your friends. We drove down last night and came in about nine o'clock or so, went riding. It's pretty sweet. If you get here early enough, on, uh, we got here Sunday night, no, sorry, Monday night. Uh, you wait till dark and then you just push it over when there's nobody out in a boat. But the best place to put it is actually behind your motorhome so no one else can see it. Down comforter. Full body pillow. It's quite the setup. I, I woke up sweating this morning. That was dinner, but uh, yeah, it might be breakfast in the morning. There's good reason why they say this becomes the fourth largest town in Alaska for the week of Arctic Man. Watch the ladder in your head because you bump your head. But. We had 25 people in here partying at once, man. And it's just, you know, nice and warm. We get, you know, we plug all the lights in, you know. Every year we're doing something to make the bus better, you know. Come on in, let me take you on a tour of the Arctic Man Ritz Hotel. We got 12 VIP beds. Then we got another setting room back here. This is kind of the private little compartment in the back, you know, where you can kind of get away from what's going on in front. You can come back here and just kick back and rest. We got surround sound and uh, we rock. I can't believe they bring Ison all the way from Hawaii for this. Hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Rainbow, shave ice, and proof that coffee carts exist everywhere. Double red is your release gate, okay? Got that? The next gate there is blue, so what's that mean? Don't you go both go through that? No, it's a DQ. Okay, Howard, you've got snow machines here pulling skiers at life-threatening speeds. No, who told you that? <laughs> you but, must be dreaming. No, but seriously, how did you get started on... Oh, I was a skier when I was a kid and decided that the skiing was more fun than snow machine. My brother bring me up here skiing and uh, I was sitting here one night saying, it's a big heck of a race. 1986, first race, nine competitors, 90, watcher, 90 people watching the race, you know, very, very low key. Uh, you tapped him on the shoulder to go, and we did a stopwatch, and we down below, we took two stopwatches, compared to the time, broke timeout. Very, very low key. It's come a long way since then. Okay, you can show. Women's snowboard is next to the three of you. Draw them in the order we spelled your names up. Seven. Number seven. Sonny, where are you at? Yeah, last one left. Number six. You defaulted. Five's my number, but we're okay with six. I always wish I could share the Arctic Man with my family, but I don't believe anyone in my family's ever seen one extreme ski movie, like a whole movie even, you know? So for me to try to explain to one that I do is very foreign. I live almost this fast all the time. <laughs> Like, a lot of my time hasn't, it's my own. I choose what I spend it on. But um, I don't leave myself a lot of downtime. <laughs> we had our rope get caught in our track today. And my driver got a little bent and I said, you know, it's perfect that it happened today. Today doesn't have to be our day. Tomorrow has to be our day, you know? And I know it's gonna be, it's in the stars, it's in the numbers, it's, I can see it in my driver's eyes. Like, since we've met, like, we've, neither of us have had any doubts about each other's, like, skills or, abilities and it's panned out.
everyday towing has just been phenomenal. We finally made it to race day. We're in Racer Alley where riders are tuning up their sleds and getting ready to head up to the course. Now there are going to be thousands of people up there today, so things should get interesting. We're about to head up there ourselves. Some people just get outside the spray. I like to stay right in it. This place is a zoo. Sunny looks great coming through here. I can't wait to find her at the finish line. Have you seen Sunny? Yeah, she won for... Uh... Yeah! Number one, baby! They got our time wrong. It's 5.15, five minutes, 15 seconds. Right. It's a winner's circle over here. All right. How you feeling? That's all for the world. You tired? Nope. taking a slight detour from the main highway and while I'm sure there are many fun things to do here I've heard about this new gallery that's opening up and they're allowing me a sneak peek oh my goodness I've seen doll sheep on the wall, but these are full, realistic scenes where wolves, <laughs> wolves have taken down a caribou and the bear has come and uh, taken their kill from them. From Glen Allen, we'll make the last leg to Valdez, passing through Thompson Pass and the Chugach Mountain Range. Once a town built on mining, it's now black gold that helps keep Valdez alive. It's probably most known for the 1964 earthquake, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and its fabulous fishing. But in recent years, it's become a major hub for world-class winter sports, because the peaks that were once a threat to early travelers are now a major draw for outdoor adventurists. I love the smell of the ocean. It's almost as nice as being on top of the mountains at Arctic Man. It's nicer. <laughs> and I hope I'll get a good night's sleep. It's 7.30 in the morning on one of the busiest heli skiing days of the year. They're gonna get us up in a copter, I'm excited although they're really busy, so uh, we're pretty much just lucky as can be to even get out there. Apparently, 
Things change minute to minute around here. I didn't think I was going up. Now they're telling me get your snowboard gear. They're going to put me on the mountain. The light's flat, but so we're going to stick to a pretty easy run. I'm excited. I had to borrow these goggles, and I got my favorite boarding socks on, so I feel set. To the front of the aircraft is where you want to be, so the pilot can see you, and you can see the aircraft and the pilot's face. So always approach the aircraft between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. might be in over my head, but <laughs> I am not complaining. Thank you, thank you. The skiers weren't too happy with the first runs, but boy, they made up for it for last runs. Now they're afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I think Heather's cold. <laughs> Out of this world, I found myself in tears on that mountaintop. I saw mountains as far as the eye could see, steep ones. I was up on the top of that mountain thinking, my mother doesn't even know where I am right now. <laughs> Looks like I got my wish. I met some local boys and they're gonna take me out on the water. As you know, this was where the oil spill was in 89. I was feeding otters when I was a little kid. They had all the otters and uh, animals. They were, you know, they were using, I think, Joy or Dawn dish soap on them all. You know, town doubled in size overnight. There's a lot of people that came here just rushed from Anchorage when there was an oil spill. There's a lot of money to be made. Uh, there's, there's so many jobs and so many things going on. So many animals being saved. Uh, little Valdez uh, transformed. Some people actually. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think uh, call them Saint Hazelwood because there's a lot of spillionaires, is what we call them. Oh. People who made millions on the spill. Whoa. So the spillionaires all have their modular homes and trailers double deckered now. <laughs> there was a lot more abundance of wildlife. I mean, like a hundredfold from what there has been lately. I am one of those displaced herring fishermen. I used to fish commercially. So, since there are no more herring to fish, since our season has not been open, I have been uh, gone to other modes of work, running charters. trip. I met a lot of people who embraced the same adventurous spirit as the pioneers who blazed the original Valdez Trail. It's going to be hard to top this one. For more information on the places visited on this or other episodes of Anywhere Alaska, as well as behind the scenes photos and additional travel options in the state, you can find us online at anywherealaska.org.
To order a DVD of the first four episodes of Anywhere Alaska, send $29.95 plus shipping and handling to KUAC TV, PO Box 755-620, Fairbanks, Alaska 99775, or order online at anywherealaska.org. This program is funded in part by the University of Alaska, by the University of Alaska Geography Program, and by the University of Alaska Fairbanks, America's Arctic University. Additional funding provided by the Alaska Travel Industry Association, promoting travel in the state of Alaska.